Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Hop Ons Podcast, a community review podcast sponsored by our Patreon supporters. My name is Colin Cox. My name is Jonathan Matthew Phelps. Colin, good evening. How are we? Hey, this is fun. So we yep. have technically a new patron, but they're an old patron oh, yeah. who decided to who decided to return home. So we welcome wanted back. to welcome back. We don't typically do this, but producer Jeff, he's back. Welcome back. Your dream was your ticket out. <laughs> welcome back. I think I think our audience is old enough to know Welcome Back Cotter. Maybe not. I it had John Travolta in it doing this. I, hey. Oh, how's it doing? Hey. Hey, we are shrugging so much, but <laughs> Jeff, welcome back. We've missed you. He always sends the best emails and he's active on our Patreon page. So there Jeff is back and this is another reminder. Hey, if you want to become friends with Jeff. In addition to all of that juicy, sexy, oh. explicit content, oh, oh my which I can't God. talk about here because yeah. of, you know, federal regulations, yeah. then just join the Patreon and, and discover, I don't know, John's favorite fetishes. That's one of our episodes. It's spectacular. Yeah. So. It's great. So, so many wieners on the Patreon. So, come on <laughs> over, Colin. How are we doing tonight? We're here to talk about... A, an episode of television. I, speaking of sexual exploitation, John, oh. we are here to discuss season five, episode seven of Community Bondage and Beta Male Sexuality. <laughs> okay. This it's episode, gonna be a loosey goosey episode tonight. I feel it. I'm happy this about episode this. Episode originally aired on February the twenty seventh, two thousand and fourteen, directed by Tristram Shapiro and written by Dan. Do you think it's Gutterman? Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Whatever makes you laugh is what it is. Or, Colin. or is it Guterman? Oh, is it is is it one T or two? It's just the one T. Does it have an umlaut over the U? No, there's no umlaut over the U. <laughs> no umlaut. <laughs> then I would say, I would say Guterman, <laughs> which is even better. Oh it's my god! It's so much god. fun to say. Yeah, uh, Dan Guterman wrote this episode, John. This is your IMDb <laughs> plot summary. Jeff helps Duncan score a date with Britta, and Abed has a hickey encounter on his way to the movie theater. That's what it says, a hickey encounter. It's so bad. Did you change that? No, okay, I haven't so. touched it. <laughs> well, there's reasons why I might have been suspicious. Yeah, correct. John, I'm for a, a bit of context, yeah. you are yeah, a stinker. Please. You are a rapscallion sometimes. Oh, on yeah, ABC... Countdown to the Oscars at 3.4. So, John, this was 2014. This is it. Hit the and then we'll hide the and all what heights will hit. On with the show. This is it. Hey. hey. Okay. So, so um, not a proper game, but do you remember the 2014 Oscars? Some of the big winners? Oh, it's probably movies I did not like. What was in it? <laughs> Well, okay, so this was this was the year that seemed to really codify um, this pinnacle for a particular actor who I think to this point people thought had no business being understood as a serious actor. Oh, is it? No, it's not Jim Carrey. No, who it's not. It? N no business being a serious actor. To this point in his career, I think people would say... We have no business thinking of this person as a serious actor. Will Smith. No. Okay, who is it? So I had a spectacular time at the Oscars. <laughs> oh, was year. this uh, was won, this um, I won best Dallas actor. Buyers Club? I won best actor, and I was in I was in a movie about space and time and how we oh Interstellar the cosmos. Oh, I think that was 2014. Anyway, but the point is McConaughey. This was the McConaughey. Did he win for Dallas Buyers Club? Yeah. What a flick. Good flick, by the way. The, Maybe best, it wasn't... the best Jared Leto picture. Yeah, he, he won uh, Best Supporting Actor. Maybe it wasn't Interstellar. What was that other space movie? In 20... With, oh, uh, Gravity. Gravity. Gravity, that's what I'm... Okay, yeah. sorry. McConaughey, hey, he might have been the tall alien. 
But no, it wasn't Interstellar. My mistake. There's no alien in gravity. Anyway, Colin, let's move on. No, there are aliens in gravity, right? There's not. There are not aliens in gravity. Don't they make the circles? That's Arrival by Denis <laughs> Denis Villeneuve. Denis Villeneuve. I'm just confusing all these movies. Gravity is no. the one where Sandra Bullock is stuck in a space capsule and it's sort of orbiting. I saw it in 3D. It was cool. Okay. But she's talking to her dead partners, George Clooney. Spoiler alert for Gravity. Now I, now I He's remember. dead as fuck the whole maybe, movie. Maybe one of the funniest jokes I ever heard at one of these like Oscar ceremonies. I think maybe Amy Poehler or Tina Fey said something like, Gravity, a movie where George Clooney would rather die in space than date a woman his own age. <laughs> That's great. That's great. I can't do a McConaughey. My favorite McConaughey joke, really quickly. Please. He was on Between Two Ferns. Yes, he was. With oh, yes. Zach Galifianakis. And Zach Galifianakis says, when you and Woody Harrelson were on set on True Detective, were you really sad that somewhere there wasn't a sack being hacky? Yeah. <laughs> a sack being hacky. That's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> so good. No, that's a fantastic so joke. That's a really solid joke. Uh, but, John, let's continue. Yeah, ABC... Countdown to the Oscars. This was 2014. Peak reconnaissance, 3.4. On CBS, bangers yes. at 10.7. Who would like a banger in the mouth? Yeah, bangers. <laughs> Sheldon doing work here. Whoa, whoa, they they crushed 10 point something, right? That is correct. Uh, the big bangers theory. Big winner at 10.7. <laughs> John on Fox, American Idol at 6. Who won that night? Do you know? On this evening, it was actually that terrible band that Bruce Willis is in. Um, that's just him. Wait, what was? Didn't he have a? He had no, a. He had an album a called. He yeah. had an album called "Honkin' on Bruno," which makes me laugh a no, lot. He did. That he did. He really? Yes, he did. Of "Honkin' on Bruno." That. Yeah, yeah. No, they. Uh, they were the big winner. Uh, so he's hey, American Idol winner, not an Oscar winner. Burn! What the fuck's Bruce wrong Willis. with you, Burn. Academy? Wait, okay. Name one of his roles that he would now. Not I don't care, but I mean, what's a role where he should have won? Maybe best actor, best supporting actor. Whatever. There's a few. Six Sense, number one. Okay, I would say the first Die Hard. I think McLean's worthy of it. I think he's very good in that. Yeah, not at the time. They're not giving a best actor to an action movie, right? Uh, no, they they the Academy has no balls, Colin. Oh, they have geez. no huevos. Anyway, how we do on Cal Community do? NBC Community 1.7. Not so good. Not the not best. Not so good. Not, so, not good. so good. This episode also not so good, Colin. I was... Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. It's a sad I don't know fucking good. mean episode of a television show. At times. That I think yeah. has, a, has a kind of a sweet wraparound. Yeah, but the the best narrative is the one that you don't understand, which is Chang's. That's the best story. It's spectacularly funny. Yeah, it's spectacularly funny. Um, so three main plots here, and yeah. I think there is some interesting symmetry between the A and the B plot, which we can discuss. The A plot, Britta Duncan, and primarily, as I described earlier with the plot summary, Duncan attempting to to recruiting Jeff to help him score a date with Britta, the B-plot, and this is maybe more happenstance than anything else, Abed and Hickey have this protracted, um, it feels a bit like a Cold War at times, because Hickey decides mm. he needs to punish Abed for his bad behavior, at least that's how Hickey perceives it, and finally, John, this C-plot is just Chang and these ghosts. <laughs> it's just so the good. Weirdest. It's it's, it's so the funny. Plot. It's the weirdest thing. Um, but John Phelps, speak to me a little bit. What did you? Because oh. I, I, yeah, I have the impression you didn't like this episode so much. First, the first watch, I thought it was unbearable. I thought it was an unbearable episode of television, except for the Chang stuff. By the way, Chang. The reason this is so good is because Chang is stuck in an episode of I think you should leave. That's what Chang that is, is doing. Correct. Yeah. Uh, and it's fucking awesome. No, I thought it was a, a rather mean episode, a rather uh, harsh episode. A lot of it felt super slimy. The regression of Jeff is so weird in this episode. Um, 
does he does he call Britta his former lover at one point? He says a lot I, of I, things that are not. Yeah, that's great. so this fucking is, weird. Yeah, yeah, and and he even at one point says, and this is all in like the same sentence. He says something like, "She was mine first, but she's not even a piece of property to own." So that's, I mean, he he basically says that's one sentence he says where he seems to contradict himself. Um, yeah, John, there's a lot of regression in this episode. It yes, seems, yes, which is uh, interesting. I th- yeah, no, it is. I, I think um, uh, Hickey says a lot of mean shit to Abed, but like contextually, as an old cop slash uh, soldier, this checks out of something that someone of this age, this era, would say to Abed because he doesn't fully. I don't think he understands what maybe autism or Asperger's or neurodivergent people might be like. So I think this is something he would say, not fully understanding anything. That's sort of what Hickey's doing. And Abed is just in full panic mode for most of the episode. And it's not really enjoyable to watch. Uh, at least I didn't think so. I didn't really like much of that sequence at all. I think there's some funny stuff with Hickey and the duck, but it's like it's like sort of encapsulated by this whole really grimy, gross-feeling narrative of these two people just fighting with one another. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, the, yeah, again, the Chang plot's just so dumb that... It's amazing. I I loved it so much. Yeah, it's it's easily the funniest. It's that exchange he has with that janitor when he says, "You just believed a bunch of ghosts" is maybe yeah. the funniest line in the episode. John, there's a couple of things that I want that I want us to talk about, and and you can tell me how convincing this is as maybe an interpretive frame. The regression in this episode seems deliberate because this is maybe for the first time the show really grappling with what what is the significance of not having Troy. And it's not an episode where it brings attention to itself as an episode that wants to explore that, except for that one really subtle moment when Abed's building this costume and he just looks so incredibly sad the entire time. And the camera lingers over him looking at this empty chair. And so if we imagine then, well, what would not having Troy mean principally for characters like Jeff and Abed? Abed might regress to the worst version of himself. And perhaps Jeff might regress to the worst version of himself as well. And it's interesting how in this void or in this vacuum, we see the show instead of indulging in those worst versions of them, Allowing these other characters to, uh, characters like Hickey and Duncan, allowing them to uh, fill that void and really offering what I think is a poignant exploration of male friendship in particular, and maybe the challenges of male friendship. And I think because of the heaviness of that topic, it's not particularly funny, right? Like, let us have a conversation. Let us have an extended conversation about how challenging it is for men to have friendships. I, I think it's interesting, but it's not funny, and it's a hard topic. But I also think this is an episode, John, where the show, it's actively deploying maybe some of the mechanics, some of the storytelling mechanics we've seen in the past from this show, but because of the end, doing something fundamentally different with it. So not allowing Duncan to make the incredibly gross and exploitative choice, allowing him instead to... to attempt to form this friendship or codify this friendship with Jeff. And again, I think we see something similar with Hickey and Abed. I don't know if that resonates with you at all, but that's part of why I think I like this episode a little more is Mm. because it takes seriously this idea that male friendship is because of how men are socialized, incredibly challenging. And it tries to maybe offer something along the way of something positive that maybe men can aspire to, but also offering a critique of, like, why men have trouble forming friendships, what's required to form friendships, etc. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with you. I, I think um, this is a necessary episode. After Troy's gone, they have to do something to address it, and and it's better to sort of just get it out of the way now instead of letting it linger. I think... It makes sense for them to do this. I, I do agree with your points of of Jeff. Uh, I never thought about Troy keeping Jeff at bay, 
the way that um, that that maybe he did. And so that is a very interesting thing to think about regarding Jeff. I do think that the ending is nice. It does feel a little after school special sure. sometimes. Um, but I think where it goes beyond that is when Duncan goes back to the bar. I think that is sort of um, the, the uh, and I noticed something else we'll talk about for a second. I noticed that in the study room, there's a pride, there's a couple pride flags. Did you see that? Like on the bulletin No, board. no, 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 no. Like I in the mise-en-scene, that, yeah. you can cool. see like okay. they just have like some rare And so I like that the episode states that it's okay for men to be friends with each other and you don't have to feel fucking weird about that, you know? Yeah. yeah. And uh, I like even how they... That joke at the end where Dunk, where Jeff says, you know, I'm not going to have sex with you. And Ian says, we can both be two people who aren't going to have sex together. <laughs> and uh, I, I really like that. I think that's a very um, not so bold statement on this, but really subtly saying, if you like are a male, it's okay to reach out to other men and be, you know, emotionally uh, in, in touch with them. So yeah, I do like that a lot. I think the Hickey Abed thing seems more like mentor student almost mm-hmm. is the vibe sure. I get with him, especially at the end when he's doing the whole bullet talk, which is very funny. But yeah, I think, I think the majority of the episode just feels so uncomfortable mm-hmm. and I have no problem with that. I mean, I like media that challenges me, you know, but I think for a show like a sitcom, um, I don't know if it necessarily fits that vibe, like, yeah. like the way that maybe other things would. So I yeah. think that's my biggest, my biggest problem with the episode is like, a big majority of it is super hard to watch because it is just so uncomfortable. Yeah, and I think that's fair. And I guess, you know, Community is a show that more often than not has these kinds of episodes. Maybe not more often than not, but more than you would expect, right, from a sitcom, right? Um, And I always had the impression that a show like Community always thought of itself as having these episodes that were also like chapters, right? And if you think about like chapters in a book and how they work, um, not every chapter will be spectacular. You know, some chapters just need to do the work of telling a story. Um, And I think, as you said before, I think that's a really smart point, John, that there are aspects of this larger narrative that they clearly need to tell. And one of them is, well, what effect, what lingering effect uh, maybe this like unacknowledged effect has Troy's departure meant. And I also like this point you made about how, because like, wouldn't you say, and I think Jeff is like really, really bad at this, the way he would homoeroticize Abed and Troy's friendship as, yeah. because I mean, yeah. think about how, how often like he referred to either Abed as Troy's boyfriend or Troy as Abed's boyfriend. So he, he is one of the worst culprits that I think this episode almost wants to challenge a bit. That, like, no, my dude, you can be friends with a guy. Like, have a really close, intimate friendship with yeah. a person of the same sex and it not be sexual. Um, and I, I think you're you're right. Like, the, the show almost makes it as explicit as possible at the end with that exchange between um, Duncan and Jeff. Like, just this idea that, like, I know, I know that's a joke, right? When Jeff says something like, I, I do not want to sleep with you, but I think it is telling of Jeff and like, regrettably how he thinks of human interactions that they are like just either potential exchanges or they're potential sexual exchanges. And I think that's like, boy, isn't Jeff just a deeply sad person if that's how he thinks of relationships? Yeah, and and I think the the show like goes out of its way at the end to to joke about how both Duncan and Jeff are just the most unmanly, quote unquote, sort of men because you know they think bonding is we share a bottle of liquor, we argue about sports cars, and then they try to whittle, but they can't. They cut their they cut their hands because in reality they're not that level of like you know, your backwoods good old boys hanging out. They're just two guys who want to have a friendship. And there's nothing weird about that, but them doing this shit makes it incredibly weird. So I do think that's the, the, the writers winking a little bit at 
at this idea. I think yeah. I think the the ultimate message at the end of like this idea that and Duncan does this, he has this wonderful moment where he says, you know, even if you're by yourself, you're still a person. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a really wonderful line uh, from John. John Oliver is really good in this episode, by the way. Yeah, he's. I've never solid. seen him actually like act act like this. Yeah. He's really good. Um, but that's a great line, and I think that's something that everyone needs to hear, you know, from time to time, because especially like a character like Abed, and Britta even comes back and says, this was great, you know, just having a night, realizing that I'm uh, capable of feelings and emotions is mm-hmm. a really good thing. So yeah, it was, not, it was nice. I love the ending. Yeah. Everything leading up to it, I was just not a big fan of. <laughs> yeah, and, and I mean, that's one of those times where, like... Hicks and I talk a lot about endings and how they have these retroactive effects, right? Like, a great ending can make a mediocre story spectacular, right? Because it it cascades back over what you just experienced. But I, I like, in particular, John, this point you made about Jeff and Duncan as two characters who embody the failures of masculinity. Because I think this is so incredibly important that um, there's no one anywhere who successfully performs masculinity it's all just a failed performance and we all fail in different ways right and and like the the really pernicious thing in particular about like notions of masculinity is this sense that there is like this giga chad somewhere who perfectly performs masculinity because everyone fails at it and like no one i mean i think people acknowledge this but i think regrettably people who are really committed to masculinity to a very narrow definition of masculinity really miss that point that you know yeah if you were honest with yourself you would say i don't perform masculinity well but the often unspoken point is well but someone somewhere does right which means i have something to aspire to and it's just no 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 my friend like yeah yeah yeah. no one performs masculinity successfully it's all just a failed enterprise and i think like this is yeah like the essay the essay the episode subtly gestures to that i think yeah that's a really good that's a good uh point because you know there's been a, a lot of times in my life that like my wife has has mentioned man like you're all you know, being a man in these times, and she's talking about me, and I'm like, I'm not. I don't know what you're talking about, but I, I'm barely a dude most days. I, I don't have any because you know, especially in our area, like the idea of what a man is is like this sort of you know flannel wearing, big truck driving, muscle bound, fishing, hunting, camping can use their hands to do this shit, and I'm not that person. That's not who I am. And, uh, you know, that is just something that sadly, through a, a lot of different generational uh, impact, it's just this is what a man, quote unquote, man is. And I think the and, and like, like I said, in the study room where they have that whittle, that whittle joke. I love that. I was I'm actually saying whittle joke, not little joke, like I'm drunk <laughs> when they're having the whittle joke. That is the writers poking fun at this idea of masculinity because it's yeah. stupid. It's just dumb. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I've had similar feelings most of my life that I don't, you know, perform masculinity successfully. Right. Yeah. Um, right. But you know what's I mean, but what's super fascinating, like especially what you said, because, you know, for anyone who doesn't know, we're here in the American South, you know, um, everything that you just described, everything that you just attributed to masculinity. If we went back 150 years and we were in England None of that would constitute oh, total masculinity. Opposite. Complete total opposite. opposite. Yeah. yeah, because yeah, like if yeah. you were someone who was big and burly and had calluses on your hands, John, that means you were a dirty worker. That means yeah. you were nothing. Like you didn't even count as a person, right? I mean, in fact, like you said, it's the complete opposite, right? It's like, are you maybe a little obese? Are your hands incredibly soft? Is your skin yeah. incredibly pale? You are then the pinnacle of masculinity. Then you're like, I would be like, a, I would be a king back in the day. But alas, <laughs> I'm here now in the dark times where <laughs> none of that matters. For those for those of us with non calloused hands, we call it we call it the long night. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm I'm perpetually stuck in an endless winter. Yeah, by being in the Appalachian Mountains. That's where I am. In 2023, yeah. You should have been an aristocrat in England. In like I would have been so good at it. You would have been great in Victorian I England. would have yeah. been, yeah. yeah oh, yeah. my God. 
Well, well, John, let's, I mean, I, I think this is really nice because I, I think a lot of what I wanted to talk about with the uh, Britta Duncan Jeff narrative was really this exploration of masculinity yeah. and masculine friendship. Um, can we at least talk a little bit about how Britta functions in this episode? Because again, I think there is, like, you made a nice point about how, you know, Britta is more than just this thing or this prize for either Jeff or Duncan to possess. Duncan has this really nice moment when he says something that she probably, it seems, needs to hear, right? Which sure, is, for you're, sure. still a, you're still a person. He doesn't do the thing that we might expect him to do, that maybe the narrative to this point would lead us to believe that he would do, which is sleep with her when she's vulnerable. Um, but I don't know, do you have any additional thoughts about how Britta functions in this episode? Because I think it's interesting. Mm, yeah, no, I, th I think... Um... Britta acts to me like a, a mirror for the audience to sort of see themselves in because I would say a majority of people watching Community, you know, from the outset we've talked about how Community is a uh, Green Dell's a place for losers, and I think a lot of people that watch the show see themselves in that. You know, I, I mean, I do for sure. I, I think both of us, you know, in in Community College, we were definitely part of the outcasts. You know, like we, I mean, I was just like big cinephile nerd and. And I didn't really have anywhere to fit into. And I met you and like we were essentially the almost the, the same kind of the way we thought about media and film. And you were so into books and literature. And that's just not how it went where we live. You know, that's not what the quote unquote cool kids would do. And I think here there's there's that moment when uh, Britta's talking to these three fucking rich assholes who I can't stand. They do a good job at making the worst people. And she says, you know, just because I have less wealth than you means that I don't matter as much. And really like that hits because you go, yeah, I mean, that's, that's it. That's where we're at. And mm -hmm. I think Britta serves a great job at being like a mouthpiece for people that feel that way. Mm -hmm. A lot of viewers of the show probably feel that way. And I think Britta's great in this episode. She's really smart. They don't ever make her say something fucking stupid, which I really like a lot. Um, she's respected by her friends, even though it starts out in like the dirtiest way with Jeff and Duncan, she ultimately is given respect and she's great. I think Britta's, this is where I would like Britta to have been the last five seasons. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, yeah, totally. And, and because it feels like we've, again, another example maybe of regression, but this feels more like a positive regression. Like, does this not yeah. feel like the Britta from not just the pilot episode, but early episodes of the show? Um, and, and I think then we're maybe left to ask a couple of interesting questions, which is, what has this group potentially done to her? Um, and I think that's maybe like when I when I think about what's maybe sinister about this episode, I think about things like that, you know, Britta is so incredibly charming and smart in this episode, but this is not the Britta that we've encountered over the last couple of seasons. But I did want to say one thing. When her friend Janet makes this point, because her critique of Britta, John, I think is a really interesting one. And I think maybe potentially it has some validity to it. I mean, I would agree with you and I would agree with Britta as well that um, just because someone has wealth and status that does not mean that their perspective has the most value. But in addition to that, Janet's point seems to be all of this, all of this anarchy that you seem to um, embody, it's really just aesthetics, you know? Like, like what have you really done to meaningfully address the problems that matter to all of us. And I think her point is becoming a community college student is not the problem. The problem is, and Britta even, even echoes this later, all of her radical political tendencies are just aesthetics. That's all they are. It's just her defining herself against someone else, regardless of what she hopes the consequences are. So John, I think both, yes, I agree with Britta, having wealth and status should not then afford you a louder voice, even though it often does. But also, being an anarchist, just for the aesthetics, is also, I don't know if that's worse, you can tell me what you think, but if the point is to make the world better and different, 
I don't know. I think, regrettably, you know, the Janets of the world are probably doing more, even if they suck while they do it. I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. I don't disagree. I, I, I think, um, you know, for a long time, Brit has been the quote unquote poser is a, a word I hate to use, but I guess in this in, in, in this context, that's sort of what she is. And I think now she's seeing that, but also saying that the people she thought were, you know, these all these like people that would stand by her side and say the things she thought are also are also posers, but like in the fucking worst way. Because not only are they like not not super fighting against these ideals that she has, they've now em- they've like embodied the the wrong part of all of them. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so I feel for her in both ways. I think. Yeah, and yeah, and and much like what we were discussing earlier with like how no one can successfully and fully and totally embody what it means to be a man. I think we're seeing something similar here, right? Formally, that no one can be a purely um, committed anarchist or activist, right? We're all complicated by the particular situations of our lived experiences, right? Like Britta, I don't know, maybe there is some value in having someone um, just de- just deploy the rhetoric of an anarchist, even if they, in a, in a kind of material way, make very little, if any, difference. But perhaps there's also value in having someone like Janet, who seems to have, I don't know, liberated herself from the aesthetics of being an anarchist, while actually maybe, like, meaningfully making some change at least you know like i don't i don't know i i I think like again much like with this idea of masculinity and how we're all outside of it no one is inside of it i think you could say the same thing about being like a pure political activist right no one no one is inside of that we're all outside of it because we're all failing at it yeah, I mean, you don't have to be a dick about giving a charity, though. You know? That's true. Yeah, <laughs> that's, why do you that's think they the had moral her, of that story. Why do you think they had her say that? Not in the in the her as Janet here. Why make them super dickish about it? Oh, I, I mean, I, you know, I think that's just because uh, it's media. You know, I don't. I can't imagine that actually being said in like real life without me hitting someone. I don't think that. <laughs> I don't think anybody would say that to a person's face. I don't know. Maybe. I mean, I think. I think when you hit a level of of uh, wealth, you just don't give a fuck anymore, and you think you can sort of do whatever you want. Yeah. And so maybe that's, you know, because I don't know how much they really care. To say that would tell me that maybe you're a little bit of a sociopath is sort of how I would yeah. look at that. Or, or like I said before, you have real problems with the Britas of the world, the people who really just embodied the aesthetics of progressive change instead of actually doing work um whatever that means right but i but i do think it's interesting like the episode basically makes like the altruistic capitalist the villain which like typically it's the britas of the world who are like the villains in a lot of popular media you know so i mean that's i don't know if that gives us a sense of like how the show wants to uh, situate itself politically but i love this idea that like i don't know Figures who at least rhetorically sound more like Jeff Bezos are the ones who are the villains in this episode. Yeah. Yeah. As well they should be. Let's talk about... As well they should be. I really don't want to talk about Hickey and Abed because it makes me sad, so I guess we go ahead and just get that over with. (laughs) Well, what makes you you sad? I mean, I think there's something nice about the end of the two coming together, you know? No, okay, go ahead, please. Yeah, I mean, no, it is, but it's like Abed is is realizing that he. And here's the thing, like you know, when when our friend Rob moved away from this area, like, or when you moved away, I should say, I lost that person that I could like go to movies with and talk about movies with, and it's it's hard, man. I get it. Like, it's a hard thing to not have this sort of constant where you can just call somebody up and say, "There's they're playing, you know, they're showing like." Uh, like some a Kurosawa film at at Legacy Theaters. Do you want to go? Um, that's sad. And I think seeing Abed in that position, like I, that, resonated a lot with me in my youth. I definitely felt that way, and so that that made me sad. And then you know because he doesn't sort of understand how to handle social situations, he wrecks all of Hickey's drawings. So that also is is just so uncomfortable. And then Hickey doesn't understand how to handle Abed. So it's just a bunch of 
misunderstandings, but like on a nuclear level. Mm -hmm. And it's just not my favorite thing to watch is what I'll say. And some reasonable misunderstandings, you know, because I I think you, you said something earlier about Hickey that I think we should probably discuss. Hickey says something interesting about how he's, because like at the beginning of the season, I think we thought of Hickey as this character who, uh, knew very little about these people, but he confesses here that he's actually watched them closely, yeah. right? But that's not the same as knowing them because it's clear that he's oh, sure. just like extrapolated some understanding of this group because of his understanding of how Abed functions. And I think you're right. Maybe some of this is is maybe Hickey as an older person not really potentially understanding uh, the subtleties of being neurodivergent. But I think some of it as well is just like, if you watched this group operate, I understand why you would arrive at this conclusion and think that like, Abed's a bit of a tyrant, you know, without, without actually, because I mean, I think what we are privy to as the audience is similar to what the group is privy to, which is not the same as what Hickey, as someone just watching them, would be privy to. So I understand why Hickey arrives at this conclusion about Abed and why he thinks that the thing that will fix this problem is just someone needs to punish Abed, right? Um, And it's, it's, yeah, it's just, it's a fascinating collision of misunderstandings that I think emerge organically from a story that's really thought carefully about how to craft characters. Because we even have an explanation for why Abed is on campus on a Friday evening, which I think is just wonderful. Like it's a subtle little thing, but the show, it's even careful enough to explain why Abed is even here doing this instead of, as I think most of us would be at our homes. Right. Yeah. And, and it, that makes that like adds such another level of sadness. I think that, that, and that's my issue with the episode is I, I don't turn on a community to be sad. But then again, like if I say that, then I'm like criticized for not wanting to be challenged. It's not that. It's just I think I have expectations, and this is (laughs) this was not what I wanted. Especially given the last episode, which was like, I mean, it had serious moments, but it like was really fun to watch, and smart, and uh, really funny. And I and I think this one's smart too. But it's just uh, out of a 22 minutes, it's like 16, 17 minutes of being uncomfortable and yeah. and that that what you said about about Abed and Hickey both of them you know living this life where they don't want to go home this is what they have this is all they have that makes it so much worse um but that does make the ending a lot more sweet when they both find their their you know Abed has a friend who is very interesting now who's like been a cop and a soldier and Hickey has somebody he can have a creative outlet with. And I think that's something that Hickey would never like go out and purposefully look for. Uh, But now that it's fallen into his lap, I think uh, that relationship's a a lot sweeter in that case because they both are serving purposes that they, that they, uh, the other one needs, you know? Yeah. And I I think again, it's a beautiful, um, reaffirmation of what Greendale is and how it works, you know, that it's this place for losers. And um, it's a space where these two characters can just marauder about, linger, um, and then find something, you know, there's always something to find, I suppose, seems to be the point here. And you're right, like, it's not, it's not clean and simple. Um, And there are these moments when these two, when these two interact with each other, and you think, there's absolutely no way um, these two characters will transcend their differences. Um, But I love this idea, and I think this is something that I thought you would really like as well. It's the creative process and a mutual acknowledgement of the joys of the creative process that really bring them together, you know? And this idea that, and maybe this is, it's not a situation where they complement one another, like you would in a romantic comedy. This is one of the things I find super insidious about romantic comedies is this idea. It's it's the Jerry Maguire thing, right? You complete me. Instead, I think what we see in this episode, John, is a mutual acknowledgement of what the other lacks and, and okay, a celebration sure, sure. of what the other lacks. Like what Abed seems to appreciate about Hickey is 
his joylessness, which I think another way of saying that is Hickey, like there's substance to Hickey, you know, like he's joyless right. because he's experienced a lot of awful things in his life. And that gives him a perspective that Abed doesn't have. And what I think Hickey really appreciates about Abed is he understands how to tell stories, but also Abed is a character who uh, doesn't seem to understand that substance in the way that maybe one would need to, to tell a good story. So this is not an episode where these two characters complete one another. It's an episode where they both recognize and almost like fall in love with what the other lacks. And I love that so much, especially as a response to what we get in a lot of romantic comedies, because I hate the whole like complementarianism stuff, you know, that's not how relationships work, you know? (laughs) So. No, you're right. Yeah, uh, I, I can't really add on to that. I think that's I think that's very, uh, very lovely the way that you've you've said that. I think that's that's very good, and I agree with that. I think I think it it makes again it makes the end of the episode that much sweeter when all that is sort of placed in, um, in in front of both of them, and they are able to at some point bear bear their soul to each other. There's a yeah. moment when Hickey is yelling at Abed. And he let slip that he watched his third wife die. You it's know? so weird and funny at the same time. And you know? yeah. uh, it, it's so funny, but also it's like you got to think this guy's probably never told that to anyone. Yeah. And in this therapy session he's now having with Abed, he's let loose with that, and so he has he's already started the foundations of this super strange uh, friendship relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, the end I think codifies them as being. Uh, a couple of like I like to watch out for in the yeah. future, I think. Yeah, and even Abed, like I, I think that's really well said, John. And like Abed has this moment that that rant of his that doesn't feel like something that feels like something an earlier idi- an earlier iteration of Abed would say because it's just not terribly thoughtful. I mean, he just says the meanest things to Hickey. Um, yeah. And again, that feels like, in the same way as you said, that like Hickey's slip about his third wife, this feels similar to that, you know, that like this is Abed for all of his for all of his chatter about how he lacks a filter. I think like moments like this make it clear that Abed does a lot of masking, even though the show wants us to think he doesn't, because this does not feel like something Abed has ever said to anyone and it feels like as you said it's just something that slips out of him in the same way that hickey's confession about his wife slips out of him yeah for sure yeah for sure uh let's talk about how here's what happened with chang i'll tell you exactly what happened <laughs> yeah, knock yourself out man so chang is is living his own version of an occurrence at owl creek bridge so okay. basically what's yeah. happened is on Chang's way out to like join them at the theater, he tripped and fell and he okay. hit his head and he's continued this story. But in reality, Chang has been laying in a floor somewhere okay. for the last day, acting out this sort of shining ghosts, uh, uh, one act, one man show that he's done. It's, it's but more in of a reality, it's, it's more of a one man show. Yeah. Yeah, he's just he's just got gave himself a concussion. I think that's what I think has happened. I mean, the end, like the way he, I, I know, I think we're we're almost encouraged to believe that like it's because he's been like frantically running around pulling at his hair. But I I like this idea that instead, what we see at the end is like I don't know what a person looks like when they've I don't know spent an evening unconscious on a street, yeah. right? Yeah. Um. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. We yeah. we we did t- so. There is one little thing. Um. When Shirley and Annie are discussing the play, we do see Chang in frame. That's that's the only... I mean, aside from that, I mean, I think there is... Maybe you could argue that he's never even there, but... Yeah, that's what I'm saying. He's not yeah. there at all. He's He's acted this all out in his mind. Because think about what we see. Okay, we see Chang, and he's he's in frame. And But what what are Shirley and Annie talking about? Some movie where there are ants. The play they just saw, yeah, yeah. And an ant is like a giant oil corporation. This is what Chang thinks theater oh, okay. in this sort of situation is like. So he has written the dialogue for these two to speak. Okay. So then 
when he actually has the realization he's not there, he can exit out of his brain. Oh, I see. Yeah, because they, they do have this really strange, conspicuous exit for the episode when they say, let's go to McDonald's. Let's which, go to McDonald's. Yeah. That ain't ever going to happen. <laughs> and then the two of them are just gone for the whole episode. Yeah, and then there's like that meta joke where Annie says, it's nice for you guys to get some focus this time. Right. She realizes she's been in too many episodes. Sure. And Shirley says, well, that's easy for you to say. So Shirley's yeah. also aware that she doesn't get to be the main character that much anymore. I like yeah. that. That was a good joke. Yeah, it's a but good joke. That's what's happened. That's what's that's happened. What ha- Shang, okay. is, Shang, Shang, Shang Sung from Mortal Kombat has made up this whole narrative in his brain about this whole evening, which I liked a lot. I thought it was very funny. I'm actually persuaded by that. I mean, like, like you, like you said, um, the only possible diegetic uh, inconsistency. I think you've actually quite beautifully explained it because I don't think anyone else is in frame with Shirley and Annie when we see Chang in the background, no, and yeah, he looks he looks like an NPC as he's walking in the background. So he doesn't sure. even look like a real Absolutely person. Absolutely he does. Uh, no, that's, John, that's pretty good. You should, uh, hey, you should make a YouTube video about that. You know, like, oh, okay. it could be one of those like theories about Chang in season five of community. And you could do like a, I don't know. The clip art could be you like making this face. And then it says like, you know, <laughs> This is not a visual the classic medium, YouTuber, I know. Yeah. The classic YouTuber thumbnail. That's the best. I hate any video that does that <laughs> immediately. I'm not going to watch you just, that. You just say that. Again, I know this is not a visual medium, so our listeners were not privy to that. But. Maybe I should I should do what you did, where Colin made a fake community video just to rickroll me. It was amazing. He genuinely spent time out of his day I did. doing this. I did. Maybe I'll do that. We'll see. We'll see. How College it professor here, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, I did that. But that was back in the summer. Like I, I, I wasn't teaching classes then. So yeah. Uh huh. Now mm-hmm. here's here's the thing that I find. I mean, we can talk about this for a second. I posted it on my YouTube channel, which I don't. I it's not a thing. Like I just made a private video, and I think I was quite surprised that at no point you looked down to see, well, who actually published this? You just watched it. Well, I was like into it. I was into yeah. the episode. And you fucking, you're such a dick to me. I'm not. Gonna, I'm never gonna let it go. Are you? Are you? He ever has gonna... rickrolled me so many times. You. You just said a line from the song. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> I just rickrolled myself <laughs> accidentally. Just, that was a self rickroll. Yeah, you just. I you just self blew your, You just blew yourself. So I'm gonna. Yeah. Impl- I'm gonna implode soon. I've crossed the streams like Ghostbusters. <laughs> Okay, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Duncan's really good in this episode. Yeah, I said that earlier. Yeah, Duncan's quite good. John Oliver has a lot of range, uh, and he might be my choice for the Dean's List. Spoiler oh, alert when we get ahead. there. So, jumping yeah, I don't have much ahead. else to say. Um, I, 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 It makes me wish Duncan had been in more episodes. Uh, I'm sure John Oliver, I, I assume at this time, uh, last week tonight is starting to take off. Yeah, I think that's I, right. I would think. So he's it's been on for at least 10 years now, so he's probably um, dealing with that a lot, I, I would assume. I am so red from how drunk I am. I keep seeing myself. <laughs> I'm the ruddiest Irish person right now. Holy Toledo. Hey, if this were 1875, you would be the pinnacle of masculinity, my friend. So yeah, just keep I'd be, I would be covered in cheese and grapes. That <laughs> <laughs> would be awesome. <laughs> you would have a you would have a lovely syphilitic bride beside you, and everything would be spectacular. I would just so. be like Orson Welles. Ah! <laughs> 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 ah! Anyway, uh, I, don't, I don't have much else to uh, say. Deep, deep cut. If any of you have any questions about what that means, just. Uh, Find us on Twitter, and I'll I'll send oh, you the man. YouTube link. It's it's pretty spectacular. Um, John, I don't think I have anything else. I would agree. Like, John Oliver is quite good. I want to say that's probably why he missed all of last season because of his HBO program. Uh, but he's back yeah. for a lot of episodes in this season, maybe more than you would expect. But I do not think he's in season six. So this is the last bit we'll get of 
John Oliver as Professor Ian yeah. Duncan. And he was in season one a lot, if I recall correctly. But John, let us, yeah, let us transition to uh, some of our segments. John, you maybe teased this a bit earlier, but who makes the Dean's List for you? Who is your best performance? Britta. No, I'm just kidding. It's Duncan. I like Britta a lot in this episode, though. But I think this is the first time Duncan's actually got to show uh, a lot of range. And for that alone, I'm going to give it to him. What about you, buddy? Yeah, I think just to introduce a bit of difference and in, in variety, I'll say Britta because I think part of what allows Duncan to be so good are those exchanges with Britta, the one in the car in particular. So mine's, mine's yeah. Britta, I think. John, okay. our second segment... I need you to check the syllabus, and this is where we identify our favorite bit of metatextual referencing and intertextual play. What do you got? Yeah. I do like the meta joke that Annie makes, but for me, it is Chang making making a futuristic joke about uh, I think you should leave because he is literally Tim Robinson in an I think you should leave sketch. He, he very uh, much is, yeah. It's so good. I, when I watched yeah. it, I thought... If you just put Tim Robinson as that character and had him swear a lot, this would be the funniest I think you should leave sketch because that's all this is. I mean, even the again, the the janitor in his line delivery feels like again, this this aesthetically feels consistent with I think you should leave, right? Like Yeah. You're just going to believe a bunch of ghosts like this. Yeah. This is insane. This is madness. Yeah, it's fantastic. So, um it's, mine I is What about you? Yeah, mine I think this is this is quite obvious that shining reference at the end is actually really really funny the uh old timey photo club is <laughs> old timey photo club i love that <laughs> such a lovely subversion of a joke phelps do you have any best lines for us i did not write any down the best line in the episode though is when um abed is asking is 10 mil is nine millimeter better than 10 millimeter and Hickey says, millimeters don't matter. Bullets will just kind of kill you. <laughs> that's really, that's so good. So um, cool, yeah. That's all I got. What about you? I have a couple. So, have you met the women who like me, Jeff? Neither have I, but trust me, they're bad people. That's something Duncan <laughs> says. I don't think he likes himself. Why doesn't he pronounce it Michael? I think this is a thing Jeff says about Mike oh, Hale, yeah. which he Mike he's, Hale? he's so drunk that I think he misses the fact that his name is Mike Hale and not Michael. It's Mike really, Hale. Really funny. Yeah. Um, have fun circling my former lover, waiting for her to cry. I tried to make that sound good, but that's what you're doing. That's the thing Jeff <laughs> yeah. says. Uh, Jeff Lyon. Oh, and what kicky punch movie is that from? The ones you've seen or the ones I'm going to watch you miss? And then he laughs, laughs like a crazy person. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here it is. Let me tell you something. For five years, I've watched people walk around on your eggshells. Oh, Abed, he's so imaginative, so magical. Everybody hide their hamburgers. If Abed <laughs> sees a hamburger, we'll all travel in time. Let's eat cookies and ice cream and, just, and dress in pajamas in the middle of the day. I watched my third wife die. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a thing that happens. Um, who says, oh, this is a thing that Duncan says, Oh, here we go. Love isn't a game, says the guys who always win. And now you're going to go pull a Dane Cook in one of those three movies he was in about <laughs> Dane Cook getting laid by accident. Only it's not a Dane Cook movie, Jeff, because this time someone's watching me, your friend, British Jason Biggs. <laughs> that was great. That was very good. That was very, what else very do good. we have? Uh, oh, dude, when uh, Hickey says, I'm not pitching to you, that's a really, I don't know why that's funny, but just like he <laughs> knows that language, good. like pitching is yeah. so wonderful. Um, <laughs> and you just believe them? You just believed a bunch of ghosts? <laughs> <laughs> nice. Oh, uh, Hickey's publishers are interested. Uh, you drink scotch? No. You're gonna. I mean, he's You're so gonna. he he has like that sleepy Harrison Ford energy at times in this episode. It's really does, great. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Millimeter don't make no difference. Bullets just kind of kill you. Fantastic. <laughs> so good. God, it's so good. good. Uh, John, that is our conversation for season five, episode seven, bondage and beta male sexuality. John, we have a Patreon page. We <laughs> we do have a Patreon page. Caught hitting the bees on that really fucking hard. We have a Patreon page. 
For $3 a month, you get all the exclusive content. Luis talked about an episode of Inside Number 9, an uh, episode called Sardines, which was a really fun uh, little conversation we had about this super dark comedy. If you want to listen to that and all the other exclusive content, it's $3 a month. Uh, it's the first link in the show notes above that. You become producer of the show. You get a sticker. We talk about you every episode and how much we love you. Above that, you get a shirt, a sticker, all the content as well. Above that, I don't know. We can watch like an Ingmar Bergman movie together. I oh, guess, that would be fun. Want. I would like that. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I would, think... I'm saying that because I watched The Seventh Seal today <gasps> in between my viewings of Community. Uh, I'd never seen it before. It was my yeah. first viewing. What a flick. What a flick. You know, this Bergman guy. Pretty good, pretty good director. I don't I, know if you heard of this guy. I've, I've, I've heard the kid has talent. That's what I've heard. Yeah, John, dude, I watched a movie on Sunday. Um, this movie, from the premise, has no business being good. It's like a 2005, 2006, like quasi raunchy college film called Accepted. Have you seen this movie? I. Is with this Justin the movie Long? with Justin Long? Yes, I have. It's a really good movie. It's a very funny, good it's, movie. Jonah Hill's awesome. in it. Jonah Hill's He's in a, it, yeah. He's Ask Me About My Wiener guy, which <laughs> is always fucking funny. Dude, That's always funny. It's a really cool movie. Like, a lot of the really awful things you expect from those kinds of teen movies doesn't have at all. It's a really good movie. It's, it's I, I so thoroughly I'm, I'm sorry, it. are we comparing yeah. Accepted with Justin Long to The Seventh Seal? By Ingmar Bergman? Is that what... I mean, you might think that. Is that what made you think of this? You might think that, but I couldn't confirm it. Is is Max von Sydow in Accepted? Does he just pop out of one of the rooms? <laughs> That's... Yeah, no, actually... You keep the, that noise down! That's what he does? The female love interest is played by Max von Sydow. That's correct. Oh, that'd yeah. be crazy if that <laughs> yeah. was a thing. He's a he's a convincing nineteen year old girl. It's pretty awesome. So. <laughs> they gave him a bob wig. <laughs> <laughs> I love you very much, Justin Long. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh my god. god. Uh, producers, thank you to the following producers of this incredibly silly podcast. Thank you to Katana, Crendy, Rachel, Kate, Daniel, Lars, Rob, Robin, Jeff, and Andrew. And John's right. It's the first link in the show notes. The second link is to our Threadless page if you would like to purchase Hop On's podcast merchandise. And John, if someone were so inclined yes. as to rate and review this wonderful podcast, what yes. would you say? What would I say? Well, it would be great. It helps the show get noticed, and we would really appreciate it. We'd also read your review here on the air. You can have me do it in my Max von Sydow uh, impression if you want. Anything you want. I'm just on a big Max von Sydow kick right now, so anyway. Wasn't Colin, he in one of those newer Star Wars movies for like he a was in second? 14 seconds of yeah. The Force Awakens. He gives the plans of the Death Star. No. The plans of where Luke Skywalker is, right. that's it, to Poe Dameron in the beginning. What a yeah. great little set, that action piece, where they fire good. a blaster at Kylo and he holds the blaster in midair. Yeah. Oh, man. Remember when those movies were cool and then, oh, something happened. They disappeared. Yeah, we talked about this. I, I, I like the second one directed by Ryan. Is oh. it Johnston? Johnston? Ryan Johnson. 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 Yeah. Okay. I have no yeah. problem with that one. Yeah, I like that one a the lot. The last one is just impossibly bad in yeah, every it's, sense it's, of the way. It's tough to watch. Yeah. yeah it is yeah, a tough yeah. watch. Yeah. Yeah. We they had uh, to prop up Billy D. Williams with a broomstick. <laughs> they, put it, they put it up his shirt. <laughs> Because <laughs> he couldn't even walk. And they yeah, just have I shots mean, of him. He doesn't know yeah, where he is and he's just, just like laughing. Star- yeah, it's like Star Wars Episode Nine Weekend at Billy's. You know, it's just yeah. awful. They yeah, it's so. it's rough. It's yeah. anyway. I'm hot. I'm drunk. <laughs> I'm going to bed now, Colin. Thank sure. you for this lovely lovely evening. Well, yeah, for the Hop Hunts podcast, my name is Colin Cox here with English aristocrat. If he were born in a different era, John Phelps. I say, Governor, I, I do appreciate talking about the community with you, if you guess what I'm saying. It's been a very good time this evening. Women, the right to vote. <laughs> <laughs>